It's 5.37 a.m. in Silicon Valley, and you're listening to Night Call. Hello and welcome to Night Call, a podcast for your strange days and lonely nights. We've gathered here together to defeat death. We're going to defeat loneliness and strange days. <laughs> We're going to make the night last forever with just a small vial of blood. <laughs> we are all Elizabeth Holmes, uh, but I am also Molly Lambert. With I, me today, I'm Tess Lynch, and uh, over in Austin, Texas today, we have Emily Yoshida at the uh, aforementioned Yoshida Innovation Hut in South by Southwest. What are we uh, cooking up at the Innovation Hut today? Okay, we can't do this the entire podcast. <laughs> I'm going to bit over for now. We can bring it back. I don't second. think I might ever be able to stop. Once it's really, start, once it's you pop, really incredible. It's addictive. Why are we talking this way, guys? Well, we all watched The Inventor. Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. Which is going to be on HBO uh, the Monday that you hear this, I suppose. It'll be on your TV or on your parents' HBO account that you... We saw it in advance using the time machine Elizabeth Holmes invented as a child. Yes. Just to clear something up really quick, this is not a sponsored post. We were so excited to see this documentary that we requested a screener. And so we're not being sponsored. We were just really excited to see this. And it's really good. Access journalism, man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> could not have been more excited. We couldn't get Night Call into Cats for free, but we could get the Elizabeth Holmes documentary. Um, before we get into The Inventor, can I give you guys a, a, a download quick on the scene in <laughs> Austin, Texas? I oh, just yeah, for sure. Can we, get a, can we get a Momo minute about South by Southwest? <laughs> yeah. A South by Second. Um, I'm sure that's already a thing. I'm sure somebody else has already said that, so I feel gross for even saying it. But <laughs> I'm really just on movies here. It's, I've actually mercifully stayed away from a lot of the like more aggressive brand experiences and stuff like that. Although I did see like a very forlorn, like kind of big RV with sort of that tent awning thing sticking out of it for Pizza Hut. But, but it was like <laughs> way in East Austin or not like East East Austin, but it was like kind of away from everything. And I think that there was like a Pizza Hut activation at Sundance this year that I never went to, but I heard about it. So Pizza Hut is on the hunt for um, Pizza Hut is on the hunt. Yeah. Pizza Hut. I did. <laughs> did you guys ever do as a child book it where you would eat, read a bunch of books to get a free Pizza Hut pizza? I never uh, liked Pizza Hut pizza. Sorry. Roy, I just blew our sponsorship. Our producer is giving a thumbs up. We all. I'm just saying it was the original brand activation. It was like trick smart kids who are like, I'm going to read all these books and I get a reward. Back to the Elizabeth Holmes voice. Right. Uh, <laughs> And then you get like a free personal pan pizza and you're a kid. It was the best. Pan Never liked pizza, pizza as a man. kid. In fact, I didn't come around to pizza until Molly and I started eating the bacon cheeseburger pizza from Domino's oh, yeah. in college. That is true. That the was bacon a dark time. cheeseburger. Is that like a, you know, like a yes. cowboy pizza? Is that what you're talking about? What's a yeah. cowboy pizza? Like a pizza with ground beef on it and cheddar well, cheese. This is a, yeah. And, but also <laughs> yes, bacon. But... It also had bacon. Yeah, Sounds... yeah. It sounds like it should be Midwestern. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it has its origin somewhere. It was a gnarly time. But we digress. Tell us about Austin. We're just saying we're not above trash pizza, Little Caesars, any trash pizza that wants to sponsor Night Call. I'm I'm going to draw the line at Domino's because – I love Domino's. Oh, my God. No. Well, actually, they've remade it. Like, I guess they, like, changed their recipe since last time I had a Domino's. So maybe I would love it now. What's your cheap slice of choice? My cheap slice of choice. I guess you live in New York City. I <laughs> live in New York City. Also, I don't eat pizza anymore. Oh, um, right. Because right. you're lactose intolerant. Yeah. Sorry. I, but, but, but now I've realized that I can order two boots, like an entire pizza. Like they actually deliver to my apartment. So I will occasionally get like their vegan pizza delivered, which is it feels like a real treat. It feels super, <laughs> super debaucherous to have a pizza. Like every time it comes, I'm like, Look, it's a pizza. I ordered a pizza <laughs> to our house and it's here now. Um, it's the most exciting thing about being an adult. 
yeah. is ordering pizza? Yeah, being like, I want a pizza. I can just order one now, like Home Alone. But you can order anything now. I know. Yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't have, have to be pizza. pizza well, see, I order everything like under the sun. I just never get a pizza because I don't eat cheese. But then right. when I get a pizza, it's like, I'm a real American now. Right. <laughs> As nerd girls, if I had told you you could like earn something by reading books, <laughs> I know. Child, yeah, would have been a good, it's a good, well, a good carrot. Speaking of being a totally like overachieving uh, the middle school slash slash no no, but it, um, well this this ties into Theranos, of course. But I just want to like quickly shout out Booksmart, which I saw last night. Oh, here. I thought we were going straight to Theranos. <laughs> well, they're like, I mean, like if these characters in this movie took like a, a bad turn, then they could easily become little Elizabeth Holmes. But um, it is so good. It's it's Olivia Wilde's uh, directorial debut as a feature filmmaker. And so I feel like you always kind of approach these sorts of things like, OK, we'll see how good this is. But she's been doing like music videos and stuff like that for a second. So oh, I've like always just... been rooting for her. She directed a Red Hot Chili Peppers video. Yeah. Is what you're referring to. <laughs> but it was all girl skating. It's a great video. Yeah. I mean, she's like genuinely she has a lot of vision. She knows what she's doing. And like everybody already loves her from when she played Alex on the OC. Well, of course. Yes. But she's, um, like, a real deal director, and, like, the script is so funny. Apparently, it's been – it was, like, a blacklist script, like, like 10 years ago or something like that. So it's really been around for a second, but then it finally got made after, you know, development hell or whatever, and it's, like – it's. I mean, I wish it would have would not have gone had to go through all of that to like. Was make that it to your the favorite screen. thing from South by? Well, that was the thing last night where I was like, I was at the premiere for it. I, most of the stuff I've been seeing has been premieres in the Paramount Theater with like all the cast and crew there, and that's like a very buzzy sort of um, you can't hear your own thoughts type of environment to be in. And, and yeah, sometimes. you were saying with us this. Yeah, like with when us, you saw it us, was like. Yeah, I just I want to see it again because I feel like it was so um, it was so hype in there. I just could yeah. not hear my own thoughts. But but with Booksmart, and I was super tired when I went into Booksmart. But and I was sitting right next. To, I was there with Jada Yuan, um, my colleague uh, slash Fifty Two Places World Traveler, <laughs> um, <laughs> and we were both like zonked out when we sat down. And then like as soon as the credits started rolling, we're like, did we just watch the, like the next? classic a la clueless or mean girls or something like that like it Ooh. felt it felt like a really big deal movie to see there it's really really funny um it's like beanie siegel um, and caitlin dever are like these two overachieving girls who realize like they didn't need to overachieve so much because all the like partying kids and sexually active kids in their high school all got into ivy leagues too so um they have like one last night to just so that they can say they had fun in high school. So they like try to go to all these different parties and it's very kind of super bad, like um, one crazy night type thing, but it's just so charming and the two leads are so amazing. So like I would definitely, I'm, I'm giving it the night call seal of approval. Um, <laughs> in <forward>. advance? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. We accept. Yeah. Today's episode of Night Call is brought to you by Brewmate. The mission at Brewmate is to create the perfect drinking experience by ensuring every sip of your favorite adult beverage is just as refreshing as the first, no matter where life takes you. The great thing about Brewmate is that they designed really, really beautiful beverage containers that are safe for um, glass-free zones, which is awesome. Not to say that if you're having a child's birthday party, you necessarily need to be drinking wine or beer. But if you do necessarily need to be drinking wine or beer, you can carry it in a really stylish vessel from Brewmate. Um, they have a really wide array of products that are all gorgeous. Unlike other brands that only cater to the outdoorsman or outdoor fanatic, Brewmate has a stylish solution for everyone. They have over 30 color options to choose from, including matte, glossy, and glitter finishes to match your drink of choice, style, and personality. I'm particularly a fan of the matte black, and I also like the Carrara marble and the wood. Their BevGuard technology ensures there's never a metallic aftertaste. Drinks taste great, and they're the same temperature from the first sip to the last, which is awesome. If you're sick and tired of hauling around ice and being limited by glass-free zones, Brewmate's products are all glass-free zone friendly, and they don't require any ice to keep your beverages at the perfect temperature. You can pour it, put it in your bag, and go wherever you'd like without lugging around an inconvenient heavy cooler or ice. Brewmate works with hot or cold beverages, so it's great for keeping alcohol cold, but amazing at keeping things warm, too, so you can use it for coffee and tea in the morning and end the night with a nice cold one. 
Right now, Brewmade is giving our listeners a special discount of 15% off your first order when you go to www.brewmate.com and use our code NIGHTCALL. That's 15% off when you use our code NIGHTCALL at brewmate.com, B-R-U-M-A-T-E.com. Don't let summer heat ruin your drink. Go to brewmate.com and beat the heat this summer. That's B-R-U-M-A-T-E dot com, code NIGHTCALL. Something else that got the night call seal of approval in advance was the inventor Mm -hmm. of For Blood in Silicon Valley. I think we are just generally interested in sociopaths. Uh, especially like business sociopaths. Yes. I mean, Mm -hmm. she, so Elizabeth Holmes was a very, very, very private person. And for some reason, you can tell that just by looking at her. She doesn't blink very much. Yeah, the blink is weird. In the film. You can and just then tell. you're t- are trying to figure out what's so off about her. And first of all, it's that she does a fake voice, which is, by the way, but not goes, mentioned in the documentary. It goes in and out. It, no, there I are think somebody does things. mention it that she does it when she's like playing herself for an interview or something, but. Like person to person, it would it would kind of lessen. I mean, I think she has a naturally kind of lower voice, but well, but she really it. plays it up in, I in don't like know. interviews. I don't know. There are truthers out there. There was a segment from a podcast that you can find on YouTube where she slips and her voice is much higher. Yeah. Really? And there's a podcast about it that I think people were saying also they found like people who knew her before and were like, that's that's new. It's wild. Um, But she also wears the Steve Jobs turtlenecks all the time. She doesn't blink. I have a pet theory that she's maybe wearing color contacts. No, Hmm. really? They're very intense. And when they show the older pictures of her, it looked like she had brown eyes. And I was like, wouldn't be, wouldn't put it past her. Right. Well, the thing that's so jarring in it is, I mean, kind of skipping forward. First of all, this is a a documentary by Alex Gibney, who's like done all of the big HBO documentaries recently. He did the Going Going Clear Clear Clear. Yeah. Um, and he, Enron. He, yeah, they yes. did the Enron yeah. one. He Which, did, interestingly, um, Elizabeth Holmes's father yeah, looked at Enron. That explains it all, yeah. I think. Mm. Um, and they don't maybe bring that up in the documentary? No, they I don't. think they they maybe briefly mention it, but you have to, you know, Blink look and you'll into miss it. it. Right, but you're yeah. like, no wonder she's a scammer. She, mm-hmm. like, her dad was a scammer, and they, like, lost a lot of money, apparently. Yes. And they, they ran, I mean, all of their friends were, like, these kind of luminaries, and I guess well, that her, like, great, great grandfather uh has like a hospital named after right him. she used she like used just rich white privilege to scam her way to the top of silicon valley but again it's like the people on the she put on the board none of them were scientists right they were all She's people like henry like, kissinger henry kissinger <laughs> which is your first clue <laughs> that something may be amiss he's also on the international olympic committee he gets paid to go to the olympics um yeah, just like a bunch of really bad people from politics that were connected to her family because she had like DC connections. Yeah. Yeah. And then she got a bunch of seed money. It was like she made the company exist based on this idea that she could create a blood test from a pinprick sample of blood. Well, for anyone who's not familiar with Elizabeth Holmes, her company Theranos um, is basically – the origin story is that she was terribly afraid of needles and her mother and aunt or like another family member were so afraid of needles that they would faint. So her idea is that instead of drawing from the vein, you do a pinprick, you get a tiny, tiny sample of blood and then you feed it into this machine called the Edison, uh, which later I think she tried to rebrand as Mini Lab, which looks like a small, you know, printer basically, yeah. and that that would be able to run a battery of tests, like 250 different blood tests. But in actuality, uh, when this was rolled out, the the pinprick wasn't enough blood. You actually had to do the regular draw, and she was lying when she said that the tests were being performed by the Edison because they actually were being performed by the the more traditional um, blood testing machines that are big and bought from third parties. Yeah. So Yeah, there's the a deal. lot of stuff that the documentary goes into, like, you know, drawing on the irony of calling the box the Edison, uh, because so many of like Thomas Edison's patents were things that he also did not really know how to do. But would say he he did them and find some way to like you know do a demo at a world's fair or whatever and make people believe he'd done it and and then and then in the background you know uh, right uh, work until like he th- actually gets there. 
there's yeah. a thing I couldn't believe they didn't use in the documentary because it's such a because they were using other stock footagey things mm-hmm. where I was like waiting for like here's the stock footage about the mechanical Turk which is like this famous uh, fake automaton. Mm-hmm. It was like a, a like auto- it was supposedly a chess playing robot I think uh-huh. and then it turned out to be just a guy. Oh, <laughs> but they brought it places and presented it as like it's a robot that right. plays chess and yeah. can like you know just see your moves and like play against you but it was really a guy in a box inside of it <laughs> like manipulating it and so anything there's something like that you're kind of like yeah you can like maybe trick people into thinking it works in like your lab environment but that I mean, was like there were so many the, things about it yeah this is all the science version of the stuff we were talking about last week with the psychics and spirituality it's like yeah. you take advantage of the stuff that people want to believe in and you make it just credible enough that they'll look over any of the like cracks or uh, inconsistencies or something. Because people really wanted this. Like it would have yeah. been like a real disruptor of the entire diagnostics industry. Right. Which but is, they like, show a like thing. there's a professor immediately who's like, you can't do that. It won't work. Yeah. yeah. You know. And, and she had declined to kind of work with Elizabeth Holmes on the project and passed her on to someone else. And then that person got taken in by the crazy eyes. A lot of people got that taken woman in. Is a lot amazing. of old white men, especially, got taken in. A lot of old white in. men got taken in. And the professor also- is amazing, though, because she's so like, I, like, she does not she's give a cool. fuck anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like, she's, like, she's a good yeah. character in the documentary. Yeah, she's the one. She's one of the good people. Um, everybody else gassed up Elizabeth Holmes because she was, like, the perfect embodiment of what Silicon Valley wants to believe about itself. And Well, she was one of the only female, like, CEOs in one of right, these disruptive she, right. sector, like, sector disrupting industries and so there was a lot of incentive to play that up for you know the right this well, it was modern also like American she, hero she bought something. her way in but like so did the rest of them mm-hmm. and right. like yeah. uh that was the thing too is when they were like well everybody liked all the move fast and break things but like you can't do that in medicine and i'm like you shouldn't do that in other things either like yeah. it's always just like breaking labor laws yeah. you know is what it always it's what that's what the break that's, things is. yeah that's what gets like broken. With yeah, like Uber is also like a big fucked up company mm-hmm. that like just keeps secrets about itself. All these pe- companies are just like, well, we can't yeah. tell you. What's well, really interesting about the threat posed by Theranos was eventually um, towards the end of the documentary, they talk about how people were coming in to be tested for syphilis, and nobody was really trained. There that was, was the only test they could get the machine to do was to right. test for syphilis. Right. But it's also like the separation of the carpet world, which was like the, you know, kind of slick Silicon mm-hmm. Valley, like Elizabeth Holmes was like wandering the halls in this glossy building, and then the tile floors where the lab technicians were working. And I think it was you know, they're like in the science realm that people finally came forward and were like, hey, this science is bullshit. Like, I would not trust these test results. No one should trust these test results. It was, you know, yeah. it wasn't in the documentary, but um, I think it was in a Vanity Fair article about her. Maybe there have been a bunch of articles, obviously, over the past year or so. All of which we read last all night. All of which we read last <laughs> night. But about her dog. Um, she has a Siberian. Balto. Uh, yeah. Balto, the Siberian husky, who she told everyone was a wolf. But <laughs> she would bring him to work and he would contaminate samples with by like shedding and he wasn't housebroken. No, it was just like peeing everywhere all over the place. It was a real And she mess, would just pretend guys. it wasn't happening. And yeah. I think that's just her general attitude right. to life. And it takes you so far. Yeah. Um, that's the whole thing is it's just like people would come to her and be like, it's not working. It's never going to work. And she was just like, you're not trying well, hard enough. Well, she was enough. impenetrable. Yeah. I mean, she wouldn't, she wouldn't disclose any of the mechanics of the machines that she had designed or, you know, had kind of used other people's uh, ingenuity to help design. I think yeah. that was one of the people um, who she worked with, Ian Gibbons, who was one of the scientists that, you know, she kind of took some of his work and brought him on the board and he eventually committed suicide. Yeah, um, which yeah, his, that was real sad. It was super sad. And his widow, you know, talked about how uh, Elizabeth Holmes had called up after he died and instead of offering her condolences was like, hey, I'm going to need everything, uh, all of his paperwork that yeah. related to Theranos because I don't want it to get out. 
Um, yeah, because this was really like late in the like I think that the kind of noose was tightening around them, so she was getting like super paranoid about everything. Yeah, she never breaks in the documentary because they don't get any like new footage with her. A lot of it comes from the stuff that Errol Morris. Yeah, shot. the Errol yeah. Morris, the inter- uh, inter- That's yeah, like the funny stuff. subtext of the documentary yeah. is the documentary and <laughs> feuding with Errol yeah. Morris. Yeah, it's total about, shade like, on Errol Morris. It's so he's shady there. to Errol Morris. He's, so, Errol Morris he's gets sitting there duped. like totally credible like you know crossed arms in his director's chair like you know asking her to tell everybody why she's a genius and it's like but that footage is incredible because that's yeah. the stuff where you're like you feel like you're looking at this mask of a human because you know the interatron is the thing that he invented where it's like so the interviewer the way that the camera is set up it's it's set up so that the person is having an eye-to-eye conversation with the interviewer but they're also looking right into the camera um so you get this like you get the unblinking stare like in in all its glory with like ring light 360 lighting around it and you can just see like she says something at some point in she the looks documentary. like an alien yeah but she also says like oh yeah i only sleep like four hours a night mm-hmm. and it's like maybe you should sleep more like you look <laughs> tired and i also feel like there's such a thing as like sleep psychosis like well, also you, who you knows can make if that's bad decisions <laughs> who knows if anything she says is true right well because it's all very buzzy i mean she's vegan and these are her smoothies and, and she, she only has sleep the and- one outfit because yeah. she doesn't want to think about how her looks right. and 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 it's like i was thinking about it because i was like not to like cape for her at all because she is a psycho but it is that thing where you're like well why is she the only one who gets punished like Mark Zuckerberg broke democracy. <laughs> I think. I mean, like, I, but I she think, didn't even give anyone syphilis yet. But this is not. This is not what she knows. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg definitely kind of like talked his way to a certain position, but at a certain point, it became something that he was well versed in. Whether he made good decisions or not, I don't know if I agree not. with that. Even I don't know if you could argue that. I, I definitely wouldn't say that he had a good grasp on the social and moral implications of what he built. But I think that he knew how to build a website, whereas Elizabeth Holmes, like, right. really doesn't know how to analyze blood. Right. And that's, like, a pretty significant difference. she knows difference. how to sell that blood pill. She oh does. Oh, my God. The, Show that pill. The Okay, so, like, I, I still feel like the worst horror scene that I'm going to see in any movie this year is the, the computer-generated reenactment of what happens inside of the Edison Yeah, when box. they show the blood just yeah. splashing around. <laughs> like, the blood is splashing around, like, the little glass vials are getting cracked, and there's just, like, blood splatters all over the place. And then place. the gloved the hand gloved comes hand. in reaching around. <laughs> it's the best. Yeah. Oh, my God, it's, it's so like, horrifying. It made me think about Velvet Buzzsaw, too. Yes. Yeah, because it's, like, a black box. It's, like, a metaphor for the company it's like you can't see what happens inside and then like if you try to go inside you might get stabbed with a blood needle (laughs) (laughs) and see all the like encrusted blood all over everything yeah it's it was i mean that stuff was pretty incredible um very unforgettable imagery (laughs) if i had a criticism though i feel like it didn't go deep enough into the psychological study of Elizabeth Holmes. I could have watched five more hours. I could have, right. yeah. That. And I would have wanted to know, like, I really would have liked to have had more insight into, like, her upbringing and, you know, how she kind of, like, her parents kind of, according to one interview I read um, with this guy who worked with his parents, or with her parents, that her parents kind of tried to, like, get her into Stanford by sending her to this Mandarin program because they heard that that was, like, a good leg up, even though she really didn't have the grades. So it was kind of like she was, like, grifting from the beginning, right. but Right, well, she was grifting know. in the way that, like, all rich people are grifting their way into, right. like, yeah. opportunities that they don't earn. Yeah. It was like, and she used it to her advantage the way that other people do she just picked a really bad thing to do with it yeah (laughs) but it was so weirdly specific that you could sort of understand why people got caught up in like the fervor of it Mm because it's like well why else would she choose this thing right why wouldn't she at some point be like this isn't working i'm gonna try another startup but she was so like it must succeed yeah i do think like the movie feels like just an ad for the Bad Blood book, uh, the John Carreyu book about her that came out a few months ago. Because it does, like, it, everything feels like you could go so much deeper in it. And I'm sure that the book yeah. does get I mean, deeper in all of it. It's also, like, maybe it's comforting to us because it's, like, a story about the power of journalism. Right. <laughs> I mean, that is the, like, emotional core. The Enron doc is the same. And yeah. In the same t- thing, it's, like, they think you're stupid, so they say things in front of you that right. they shouldn't say. But there's yeah. also the guy from Forbes who put her on the cover of Forbes and then later has this reckoning he of was, realizing yeah, he was 
I mean, he was out. upset. Yeah. And that was great right, to but see. But again, like, what if they did that to, like, Airbnb and stuff? Like, other companies that are, like, grifters that have grifted their way into a position, but, like, it's all a Ponzi scheme. Right. All the startups are Ponzi schemes. But I think what's what's different about this is that you would – at least I would think that in medicine, you know – in the kind of like disruptor culture or whatever, there's really – it should be that if you want to get a blood test, you have options other than Quest yes. and you can do it yeah. yourself and it's uh, cheaper. Nah, like I, if, if I there were a like, way to do it uh, – eh? I feel like a nurse should do it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It, he, I use the Heal app. Again, not an ad. But, but I, I really love the Heal app. And I'm interested because I'm like, OK, that that solved a medical problem. And medicine, it seems you would think, would be a very high priority to improve how we have you know access to yeah. medicine beyond just healthcare. I don't trust companies. I mean, obviously, pharmaceutical companies are doing the same exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah, they they're all, it's all already a company. <laughs> but it's just like one is a different, differently I, principled one than the other. Other. Like I, yeah. I mean, I I was surprised when people started doing twenty three and Me because I was like, you could turn this into eugenics, and then right. they did. But it's like people are sort of less scared to like send their blood away in an envelope than huh. maybe I would be. I would I, not I give anyone my blood. Here's the question, though: If yeah. you needed a blood test, for instance, and you didn't have insurance, or your insurance, well, you I'm know, saying the idea that they were selling of like it'll be in Walgreens was like not a terrible idea that's the with thing. like a licensed practitioner, right? But right. that isn't how. That's it why out. it's so disappointing, though. I think, and why it's different than some of the other companies is because when you consider Airbnb, I mean, that's like a convenience, right. and it's a, not a good company, but it also isn't like a the stakes are much lower. Like you could stay at a hotel, but for right. someone who's having trouble getting access to a doctor for a blood test, yeah, but all of a sudden, like that's that's a high priority. Yeah, that's and, a, that's a yeah. much more like you must get this. And, we like, know someone. I feel like a who, lot of like I, I, tests. It's probably different for you because you have kids, but like I feel like I'm still not at the age yet where like medical stuff is on my mind on like a month to month basis, and like the right. idea of like getting diagnostics run and stuff like aside from when I'm just saying like when you cut a corner there's a reason but it's not necessarily cutting a corner I mean for like okay I mean if it had worked then I think we'd feel differently about it that's the main thing like the whole thing is just the illusion around it if this was a woman who really knew what she was doing and the Edison worked and the the blood sampling worked then we this would be a completely different story like even if it did even if it did disrupt the existing diagnostic industry, it would be a conversation un- not unlike these other industries that have been disrupted. And I'd be, and there'd be like plenty of casualties within that. But I think right. it would be a different discussion than this, where it's just like, this is about a cult of personality that made us believe in something. I that- think it's exactly. also a core bad idea. That's what I'm saying. I think I would not give my blood to a private company selling me this because it should be publicly invested. We shouldn't have to go to fucking tech startups to get. I agree, but healthcare right. we should have. We should but invest into. I totally the twist agree. Is all these companies are going public. public this year, yeah. which is going to be very interesting. I think. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, and also probably ruin San Francisco once and for all. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's been ruined. <laughs> but again, I feel like there could be a pushback when people are like, "No, we don't want this. We want." infrastructure that means we don't need the blood machines. No, I totally agree. But I also think that... You and when know, you see the crazy investments that people in Silicon Valley get for their terrible ideas, you're yes. like, what if we invested this money into medical infrastructure? I agree. I think what my point was is that people were very eager to invest in this because the idea of making you know, certain medical diagnostics available to people who can't afford them, who put it off and end up dying or whatever. It was exciting, even though it was I think it was a just fraud, a get rich quick scam. Exci- yes. I don't know. I think that I don't think Henry Kissinger was like, ooh, I can't wait to help anyone. He that, like that's not his thing. No. People just wanted to make money. They thought it was a way to make money by exploiting people who can't afford health care into having to like get the blood pill instead. But some of the some of the scientists who got on board early and no, like the phlebotomist trainer the scientists who instance, wanted they to were make like, this right. is great. Right. But they also knew it wasn't going to work. I mean there was probably a time like before there were blood pressure machines in uh, Walgreens like and you had to go to a doctor to do that. Now we think of that as much a much more casual 
thing to get done. Right. Like we, it's not a big deal that you have to like make a doctor's appointment to go get your blood pressure taken. Like you can just mm-hmm. do that at Walgreens or whatever. She Kills is a Shudder original podcast by and about women in horror, hosted by Adrian Barbeau from The Fog and Creep Show. Guests include beloved stars like Barbara Crampton, Jennifer Tilly, and Dee Wallace, genre innovators like Anna Biller, Alex Esso, and Pollyanna McIntosh, and writers, critics, and horror experts like Blair Bercy, Gray Drake, and Dana Schwartz. She Kills explores the beginning of horror, where women were kill fodder, to the standalone modern women of horror who broke the mold, featuring the dynamic actresses from those films. We're going from babe in the woods to badass with a shotgun and everything in between with the unique and richly interesting conversations that only women in horror who love horror and who examine horror can provide. She Kills debuts on March 1st. All 10 episodes will be available on Shudder March 1st. Episode 1 will come out on Apple, Spotify, and everywhere else you catch your podcasts on March 1st, with episodes being released twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays. 12, 9, 20, 5, 14, 5, 18, 19. I'm going to go with bring back in-house doctor visits. Well, that's that's why I mentioned heal is because like my so my daughter had to go to the doctor today and it's across town. You often like have to wait for an appointment, even if it's a not well visit for a little kid. And it's just to check their ears, check their nose, check their throat. Mm -hmm. It's like a three hour thing. It's expensive even with, with insurance. Then I thought like, you know, I think that heal is like a brilliant app and there are others like it like i think doctor on demand but the idea that you have doctors who come to your house for things that are not life-threatening but is it like an uber of doctor like how do you know it's a real doctor and not someone who like said they were a doctor these are ucla doctors and so you can look at their you know you can you can view who the doctor is and where they went to school and everything i've used it a bunch and like i don't know that i would want to use that in a life-threatening emergency. And in fact, when I tried, they were like, no, <laughs> go to the doctor. But I mean, it's it's not necessarily like a lot of people are, you know, saying like, I, I have the time, I have the money to just go to the doctor when I yeah. feel sick. So there have to be alternatives until we get the infrastructure going. Like I I've think. gotten sick so many times since I've lived in New York. Like I, I used to never get sick at all. And now it's like constantly like mm-hmm. I do the I do like urgent care, which is like, like the middle point between those two things, right? right. Like it's a, it's yeah. a totally it's broken. We all agree it's broken. Yeah. I just don't think startups are going to fix anything for anybody ever. <laughs> well, that's my hard take on yeah. it. Ex- I'm excited for our <laughs> listeners to see the doc. I reviewed it um, at Sundance where it premiered in January, so you can all link to that somewhere. I think that it probably like wisely doesn't get too much into this stuff because this like as you can like as we can see this <laughs> is like such a bigger problem that like yeah. there are no Yeah, I sort like, of wanted it to get into that, but it also doesn't really get that much into like Silicon Valley just sort of being a big grift and like Oh, I think it does. It does a lot. I think it does. To the extent that like it can and it's in the time that it has. As much as we're like obsessed over her persona and and the weirdness and like her voice and all that stuff. I do think my one thing with the film is that like it really fixated on that surface. And maybe it's because they couldn't get so much into her like, you know, more detailed stuff about her past or anything like that or what was actually up with her. So it just like there's so much staring into her eyes in this movie. Yeah. Uh, no, you're right. And, and you're it, looking it for something. Her, and the, there's, they focus yeah. really a lot of time on, on her, her looks. aesthetic. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I think she's a very striking looking person. And so you do get this like sense of who she is by just looking at her. But it is interesting that they didn't like crack that too much in the documentary. Yeah. I would have loved if they'd gone deeper into that. And I'm assuming that there's an interesting reason why they didn't. It felt very yeah. like male gazy in a way that like not the way we usually think of that being used, but well, it did feel like an older man being like, "What the fuck is this creature?" It's, it right. was a little. It was a little bit Basic Instinct. Yes, to be yeah. honest, you know, <laughs> totally. where you're like, this woman is like using like the fact that everyone will look at her because she's like a white blonde woman mm-hmm. like against people 
to her benefit. Yeah. She could have used some better sweaters, honestly. I the know. Steve Jobs thing was just so stupid. It worked so well on people. Yeah. And like she has a thing apparently where she would make them keep the office temperature at 60 degrees so she could wear her vest, her puppy vest, vest, which is also a thing Nixon did. Really? Oh Nixon made them keep it really cold in the White House so he could have a fire in the fireplace all the time. You know that fires are really inefficient at heating. <laughs> room. It's true. They it. suck the air right up the... He was just having a little fireside chat with checkers. Yeah. Um, she now lives in San Francisco mm-hmm. and dates some other guy mm-hmm. and goes to Burning a Man. A younger man. And blames everyone for her downfall and not herself and thinks she's going to have a comeback and definitely doesn't think she's going to jail. Well, um so that's also we fascinating. Shall see. We we stand a, a, an entrepreneurial legend. Uh. But then, yeah, again, I'm like, she should go to jail. I don't know. I don't even know if I care if she goes to jail. I mean, nothing. I think she has to be. I mean, she has been barred from working in a lab, which is good. Yeah, enough for me. she yeah. shouldn't. She should be bounced out. But like, it's funny how she's just doubling down on like, well, like. But that's kind of her secret sauce is that she right. just will not admit culpability. Which you yeah. have to do to yeah. be a CEO, maybe. Yes, you have to believe sure. your own lies. Sociopath. Yeah. Believe your own bullshit. Hey, guys, do you feel like taking a night call? Yes. Sure. Okay. Hi, night call. At a Sunday family lunch, I was talking with one of my favorite humans, Chris, my sister-in-law, who happens to be a middle school science teacher. She often has interesting science anecdotes that we collectively geek out over. The latest was no exception, zombie crickets from Nat Geo, horsehair worm, Paragordius varius, house cricket, a cheetah domesticus. The house cricket loses its will and its life to the horsehair worm. Larvae of the parasite infiltrate the cricket when it scavenges dead insects, then grow inside it. The cricket is terrestrial, but the adult stage of the worm's life cycle is aquatic. So when the mature worm is ready to emerge, it alters the brain of its host, driving the cricket to abandon the safety of land and take a suicidal leap into the nearest body of water. As the cricket drowns, an adult worm emerges, sometimes a foot in length. Ah! Ah! Why is the why is the worm so long? <laughs> I don't know. If you have a subscription to National Geographic, there's a brilliant long read entitled Mind Suckers from the November 2014 edition. Oh we will God. link to that. Night calls always seem like a safe place for all things insects. Thought y'all might appreciate the insanity of the natural order. Take care, Anna. Guys, discuss. Woo. This is insane. I've never heard of this before. Um I have a related – okay, so by the way, we got this um, a little while ago. Last night, there was a cricket in my bathtub. This happens a lot where crickets end up in my bathtub. Don't know why that is. Uh, Because they come in from the the faucet, the the drain, the faucet. I don't know. But then I was like, is it trying to – it was an empty bathtub. But I was like, is it just waiting for me to fill this so it can die and a giant worm can come out? No, thank you. Do they get um, thirsty the way that ants do? Like, like ants will always seek out. Like, they'll hang around your drain and stuff just to oh, like, yeah. get that water. It's weird. I mean, crickets. The crickets have been out in full force recently. Um, the past couple of nights in LA, making a big cricket racket. Uh, uh-huh. But I did not hear them when it was raining, so I assume they go away when it rains. This is based on no science at all. Just me sitting outside. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's really interesting that they get driven like insane by these brain yeah by brain parasites. Like, could could a cricket be driven insane? Is it sane to begin with? It's a cricket. I think it's creepy. Like, there are parasites, I guess, that like can alter the brain in different animals. Like, I don't know, like Lyme disease or like ticks mm-hmm. and stuff like that are probably like an example. Although, is Lyme disease even real? I feel like I feel like it's real, but Lyme disease is real. real. Lyme My disease dad is real. Lyme disease. There are other there are things that are not Lyme disease that people, people say are Lyme yeah. say are Lyme disease. Right. We're all talking specifically about Yolanda. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, uh, Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yeah. Who uh, I think no, I think what happened with her, this is my theory about her, is yeah. all of her shit was related to having like leaky breast implants, I think. Oh, really? And then she got them removed finally. I'm mm-hmm. not saying she didn't maybe also have Lyme disease. No, she but, talked about that. Yeah, I remember. But yeah, she got her breast implants removed and I think she's maybe like been better. I think maybe that was part of what was going on. I felt really sad for her because there's nothing, real or false, when you're that obsessed no, with No, I mean, that was a, that was a, like a 
Lars von Trier movie yeah, it was, inside yeah. that show with her and like her giant fridge that's only vegetables and like a giant bowl of lemons. Yeah. Oh my god. Aspirational. Anyway. And yet. Uh, but yeah, I think the creepy thing about this is that it's like one, it's one on one as opposed to like, I don't know, having like a, a, a bunch of like small parasites that like are gonna, on like a much. I'm going to go with any parasite as a scary parasite. Well, have you, <laughs> but like that <laughs> news for you, Molly. Like, takes over, it's like a body snatcher, uh, but with like a cricket. Oh my god! And the illustration, the like CGI re- recreation. There, yeah. There's a lot of body snatchers. Yeah, we should do more. If you there know are good parasites, though, you know my mom. I remember being really little, and my mom was like, "You know those like tiny microscopic organisms that walk on your eyelashes and eyebrows?" And I was like, "No," <laughs> and she was like, "They look like little donkeys." And so the other night, I was telling my kids about it, and I showed them a picture. I don't remember what these like, they went, tiny little uh, creatures. Yeah, and they were just like, "Get them off!" And I was like, "No, they gotta, they gotta stay because they probably." I think eat you've told guys. me this before because yeah. I remember the tiny little donkeys. That's a, little that donkeys. is a nice way to think about parasites. Some parasites are helpful. What if we're just parasites? We are parasites. On a large organism. We are a hundred percent. We're parasites. totally That's killing like, the organism right we're now. We're part of the voluntary <laughs> extinction project. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a really great. Uh, night email. I'm glad that Anna brought this to our attention. Uh, yeah, crickets are lucky, I think, also. Yeah, they you're are. not supposed to kill them. Yeah. We've talked about Don't this on the podcast because there was one time when I had one in the bathtub and I tried to save it and accidentally chopped off its head. <laughs> and then was like, what do I do? Just like cursed. It's like oh, breaking a hereditary. mirror. Like, no! <laughs> no. Yeah. I love crickets. <laughs> I like to try to be nice to all the bugs. It is. It's coming in Except contact. Except for mosquitoes, the deadliest animal. Which don't forget, it's your duty to kill mosquitoes. I know, but even then, it's like they're just you know just looking for a bite. They no, Molly, no. Um, you guys made me watch. You you decided. Don't give me any blame well, for I'll this. I'll just say, hey, this was all Emily's choice. We put out a call for erotic thrillers because this is our erotic, erotic odyssey. odyssey. <laughs> This is our erotic odyssey segment. So we went through, we got a bunch of really great suggestions, and we settled on body of evidence. Well, there's a lot of bodies to get through. There are a lot of yeah. body <laughs> movies, body double, body um, heat, body heat, body heat, body of evidence. And I had not seen body of evidence. I did not. I thought I've it was like a beloved it. classic. None of us had seen it. Oh, okay. No. I thought you. This was like a movie that had made an imprint on you. No, uh, absolutely from like not. Showtime I mean, I'd always something. been curious about the Madonna and Willem Dafoe movie, but like I had not. <laughs> seen it. Uh, well, fun thing about this movie: it takes place in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, it, <laughs> for no reason. It's the, the Portlandia of the nineties. 90- it takes place in yuppie Portland, which was amazing because I didn't even know that existed. It's I went like, into, like the most heated debate over whether or not that what Madonna lives in in this movie was a houseboat. It was a, it houseboat. Was a houseboat. It was clearly a houseboat. My husband was just like, like in, no, it's just, just like Andrew Cunanan at the end of it, American Crime Story. The whole Story. thing the whole was thing. totally Cunanan. Yes. Uh, but my husband was like, no, it's on a peninsula. It's too nice to be a houseboat. I was like, that is a luxury uh, Sounds houseboat. like your husband could work for Theranos. You're right. <laughs> that sounds like a dog that's houseboat a wolf. Denier. I want to get into this. I know it's a houseboat because in the iTunes summary for this movie, where you it can rent this chase movie to a houseboat. the lean price of three ninety nine, it says, sex bomb Rebecca Carlson, played by Madonna, Parades around naked in front of the open windows of her houseboat at all there hours, even while the lobster men couch crabs. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a scene that in the was movie. Not in the movie. No, not in the movie. But apparently it's in the trailer. It's in the trailer. I'm tra- not kidding. Okay. Really? In the trailer, well, they were like, there's a part in the trailer where she walks naked back into her houseboat, but it's not in the movie. Is this pre Damn or it. post um, body double? Because that's another like female exhibitionist one. 
Um, yeah. That's the De Palma movie. I feel like there's a lot. This was of... 93, right? I think this, this was This made me feel like we should do Basic Instinct next. Well, it's because this was Basic Instinct bad. Off. Yeah. But it's Got not because it. they were made at the same they time. They were made at the same time. Shooting began only two weeks yeah. after Basic it's Instinct. It's just really the bad. same movie, but bad. Yeah. And the only reason it's bad is because Madonna is terrible. No. no. There are so many reasons why it's no, bad. No, because I was saying it's like it's got all the erotic thriller repertory players, including Julianne and Moore yep. and, and Dan Archer. Julianne Moore. <laughs> uh, Julianne Moore is also in Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Yes, Anne Archer is. is also in Fatal Attraction. Anne Archer and Julianne Moore are in Shortcuts together. Sorry, yeah. I'm on one. <laughs> we should try to uh, do this as a um, Six Degrees a type journey because oh, yeah. Anne Archer is the connector between Fatal yeah. Attraction and Body of Evidence. So that mm-hmm. means next time we have to do... And Michael Douglas is in all of them. Yeah, Michael of course. Except yeah. for this one in he's which he's played Kevin by Bacon Willem of, Dafoe. Of, if only he'd been in this one. Um, I did not – I was not taken by Willem Dafoe's performance. And in fact, I have to shout out how bad the score was. The and score by Graham insane. Ravel. Graham Ravel, who is so good – at one point, there's a sex scene that's set to what sounds like, like coral. a, a like Catholic Enya. Yes. Okay, you were there for that. Yes. yes. That, it's because it's, it's softcore. It was, oh, it was horrible. It's early guys. 90s softcore. I was like, this movie's terrible. If I had seen it at 2 a.m. on Cinemax at like a friend's house <laughs> at a sleepover, I would have thought about it for the rest of my life. Right. It's like really? it's uh, very, it's got that kind of like bizarre, not at all real to life sex choreography that if you happen yes. to see it as a kid, you're like oh my god is that what it's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. like- <laughs> it harkens to a time before porn was readily available when like you get what you get and yeah. you don't get upset exactly um <laughs> they didn't use body doubles in the movie and the sex scenes were like semi-improvised apparently because yes. madonna just like did whatever she, she wanted like, as she a- does um as she does so she wasn't supposed to pour wax on him three times the third time was the surprise. It was a surprise. Uh, and he but was tied up. Was Her on, masturbation was scene on, also improvised. The third time was like on his dick, right? Because it like there's no... I think no, it was supposed to be like on his pelvis. There's an insert shot of all of the wax drops where you see yeah. it like on his chest. And then the third one, they, he's just staring down at his crotch and there's no cutaway. So I assume she was dropping hot wax on his Well, <laughs> it's very possible. <laughs> I have to say that I thought I had like solved the movie about 60% of the way through because there were like a lot of red herrings in this movie. And one of them was this scene out of nowhere <laughs> where Willem Dafoe is like being offered a donut, okay, in a, in, at work. And they're like, this guy randomly is like, eat the last donut. And then the camera zooms in on this one donut. And then it's like, that's it. Right. And then later, Madonna's whole M.O. is that she preys on men with heart conditions and gets written into their will. And uh, at one point, they're kind of like being coy with each other. And and Willem Dafoe's like, oh, well, do you see anyone in this restaurant who's into like your kind of your thing, your brand of kink? And she was like, yeah, but he doesn't know it yet. That's a and good I was scene. like, oh. He yeah, has that's a heart the only condition. good part in the movie. Yeah. He has a heart condition. That's why he didn't eat the last donut. Yes. So she's going to like try and kill Willem Dafoe. Oh, I like how you motivated this. why is this the donut in the, it, it was wrong. I thought... The, What's the deal with that donut? Yeah, I thought it was about the cocaine use. It, it was not a powdered donut. I thought it was, it was a powdered gray. donut. Oh. And it reminded me of In Basic Instinct when everyone's like casually making fun of Michael Douglas for shooting a Taurus right. when he was right. coked out of his brain. Yeah. They're all like, ha ha, shooter, you want to <laughs> die at coke? <laughs> oh, also so weird in this movie is how like everything hinges on nasal spray that has been contaminated with, with cocaine. cocaine. Yeah. Everything about it is weird, except again, I feel like if it was somebody other than Madonna, like again, like Fatal Attraction, you're like, it's not that he's unhappy with his wife. His wife is Julianne Moore. Yeah. 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 And she's like giving him the business. It's also. like the most nothing yeah. character also. The basic gist of this movie. It is basically just basic instinct. Uh, Madonna is a woman who has a boy, like a rich older boyfriend who is found dead watching one of their sex tapes. And he's been like handcuffed to a bed. Um, fornicated to death, he, as they he was say. Fornicated She's the murder weapon. She, she was the murder, murder weapon. weapon. She is the body of evidence. Huh. And then all you know, everybody thinks that she did it, but Willem Dafoe is a lawyer who decides to represent her for reasons unknown. He just walks up to her at a funeral and says, Do you need representation? 
uh, while she's crying. And then they start working together. Again, I don't know anything about like legal dramas at all because I never watched Law and Order. But like when he's like, I don't ask my clients whether or not they've done done it. I'm like, don't all lawyers have to ask their clients whether or not they've done it? <laughs> yes, but I also watched Reversal of Fortune last night as a okay. chaser, uh, which is another like hero lawyer who's like, I don't even care if you murdered them or not. It's about the law. It's about proving there are holes in the story or right. whatever. Yeah, so he's Getting- trying to, like, represent her as, like, this is going to become a case about her sex life and, like, she can do whatever she wants, yeah. but this is about whether or not she actually killed him. Of course, they start having an affair, and the affair doesn't then, really lead to anything except for the fact that they're having an affair. Well, it leads to, as in other erotic thrillers, a bunch of crazy uh, sex scenes yes. staged in places other than a bed. Elevator. Staircase. Parking Another garage. elevator. That's two count yeah. on elevators. They're all um, modes of conveyance, like up or down. Because like, there's yeah. the first one's on the staircase, <laughs> where they're like crawling up over each other on the stairs. <laughs> Sexiest thing in the world, as everyone knows um <laughs> every staircase like that smells like pee i mean it's like, I it can be in a house it cannot it could be in a parking garage I, it doesn't matter i think in it the parking like garage that. until they got to the car i was like oh where are they gonna do it just on the floor the parking garage she right. climbs Someone up drives on top over of the car and he goes down on her from below yeah let's talk yeah. about that <laughs> that's just willem defoe going down on madonna yeah like a hundred percent yeah uh they did not use body doubles he's just it is kind. That's the movie's kind of worth watching for that. <laughs> yeah, it's no, kind of insane still that not. it exists. Why was it like made for Madonna? It's really strange to me. Looking at this movie, like she, so apparently the IMDb like trivia section has some really good factoids, including that she was like, yeah, the sex scenes like didn't turn me on at all. They, I just viewed them as almost like scientific. And Defoe was like, no, they were super sexy to me. <laughs> well, they like, also really? had the fatal really? attraction thing where the ending got changed and she was like, it was right. misogyny. It was because it was like supposed to end with spoiler her getting alert. away with it. And spoiler alert, she gets killed. Yeah, um, she gets punished. Yeah, um, and she was like, the whole point was supposed to be like that she shouldn't get punished even if she did do it, which, spoiler alert, she did. Yeah. yeah. Um, Again, I was like not – I enjoyed the movie because it was like shot well and it's lit so fun. It's that like 80s – Is that 90s, 90s noir, 40s? Like, yeah. Everything has – like there's there's a fog machine in every um, scene. Like everything yeah. has been, you know – Venetian blinds. Yeah, yeah the Venetian – oh my god, It made me so want to watch blinds. Dick Tracy, which is maybe the only yeah. defen- defensible well, Madonna performance. I know that Molly reads the IMDb trivia. Did you also see this was the second movie in two years in which Madonna plays a character yes. who picks a bottle of champagne out of an ice bucket while wearing black underwear. The other was Dick Tracy. <laughs> yeah. Is that crazy? I would watch Dick Tracy. I think she's oh great God. in Desperately Seeking Susan because yes. she's playing herself. Right. Um, something about watching Madonna try to act makes me so uncomfortable. Oh, I know. Yeah. Because it's like she's almost good at it. But no, she's not. It's she's like not. she's... And this is like her fifth movie. It is that thing where you're like, why can't you take this skill set and just like transfer it over but she's such a good performer different it's the same thing with gaga it's like you're grading Mm -hmm. them on a curve of how bad you expect them to be right because most actors that are musicians are better at one thing or the other yeah Yeah. unless they're like uh liza minnelli (laughs) steve van zandt (laughs) steve van zandt great actor that is true underrated super underrated possibly the greatest uh actor musician (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who also uh, told Paul Simon to go fuck himself. I, know, I well. think that this movie, and I feel like this is going to be a recurring thing, but I feel like a lot of, and I feel this way about um, Basic Instinct too, obviously, is that a lot of the reason this genre exists is because all these directors of a certain generation came up on Hitchcock and they're like, what if we did it with tits? Like that's, yeah. that's oh, for sure. Which to me MO. is still like the aim of cinema a little bit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's why we're all here that's why yeah. we all I also just like how when we start the erotic odyssey segment it's like we all just like lean back in our like bubble bath yeah, right. yeah. we're all so stoked about it in the soft core <laughs> porn right because they all have like cool female protagonists yeah they're yeah. all these like really kind of I mean even I mean, she's a pretty interesting character, even though this is a bad movie. Like I again, think but I was papers, saying, like, what if what if she was played by Julianne Moore? Could this movie be right. good? Right. No. Yeah. I no, mean, I just don't. I think the script is horrible. 
it's really one of those movies where you feel like it is an extraterrestrial screenwriter <laughs> who's like, hmm, let's but, see. They all live on boats, these right. humans, right? Boats. And they they dress up like in pearls and little tiny pillboxes. We have just basic nice. instincts. This, right? this is the like um, Frasier era, too, where like I guess the Pacific Northwest was like glamorous. It was like the same yeah. time as grunge, but it was like – what if the Pacific Northwest, instead of being the capital of grunge, was just where, like, it was, like, constant uh, Hitchcock noir and all the ladies were right, raising I, girls? I get like, the idea. It's like San Francisco has the opera, and then you just keep going north. It gets, like, more opera right? you <laughs> yeah, know? Yeah. Till you mm-hmm. get to Canada, the opera east of them all. <laughs> but... I loved whenever Madonna was in an art gallery yes. in this movie because it might be oh, like the yeah. art gallery stuff in the player, just yeah. her yeah. being like, my paintings, <laughs> my art beret. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm in artist mode now. I, it's not a good movie at all, but I also... And yet, I wasn't mad. For some reason, we have collectively forgotten that there are all these like like pretty explicit for an R-rated movie sex scenes between I guess it, the foe. It, came, it was NC-17 it's it was also, originally. Team. It came yeah. out at the same time as the sex book, so it got overshadowed. They, uh, I think De Laurentiis was like, hey, can you postpone can you stagger it? this book? Because otherwise this movie is just going to be pegged as kind of like a preview to your book. And she was right. like, nah, I'm going <laughs> to do me. That's that's what I do. I'm Madonna. Um, listeners, if you have an erotic thriller that you would like to see featured on the podcast, or if you have any stories about zombie bugs, food, Anything on your mind, please give us a call at 240-46-NIGHT or an email at nightcallpodcast at gmail.com. And while you're at it, please review, rate, and subscribe to Night Call wherever you listen to podcasts. I think we got to try to get to Hand the Rocks to Cradle just so we can continue with the yes. or please. Or we just do all the bodies. The, well, I want to yeah. come back around to Basic Instinct because I kept thinking about how it is. But so, it's so similar. We got to like It's so similar, bit. but it works for reasons right. I can't fully articulate. Right. Before we wrap up this podcast, would you guys like to take one more night call? Yeah. Hey, night call. This is Dan from Encino. My question is, let's say that you came across incontrovertible proof of the existence of vampires or sea monsters or aliens. Do you think that your life could continue as normal or would you have to dedicate your life to proving what you found? Or would you try to just hide and pretend that you hadn't discovered this this unfathomable truth? Thanks. That's a super interesting question. I love yes. this question. I think about this all the time. Um, so it's the reason that I love – Arrival, which I feel like I talk about on this on this podcast all the time, but I think that that's one of the only movies about an alien, at least, where I think that the reaction is appropriate. Like, like Amy Adams literally just barfs after she has her first interaction with the aliens because it's such a it just completely turns your notion of the universe and like our place in it upside down. Like it's a paradigm shift. And you would get nauseous. I think you would have like a physical reaction to that. First, of I always all. get nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? It's not that hard to make me nauseous. I get nauseous if I go on a hike. Uh, but once you finish throwing up, <laughs> what would you do? Well, yeah. what if? Not to take it to a different question, like I always do. But what if you think you see vampires, but it's just a brain parasite? Well, but this is this. It hinges on its incontrovertible it's intro- proof. Incontrovertible. I mean, I think it depends on it depends on what your job is. If you're if you're a journalist, you should probably uh, pivot to um, investigating it or something. Uh, I don't know if you're like any other kind of civilian. You know, you take it to the appropriate people to figure out what to do with it. But I don't think that your life continues apace. I think the only thing that I might like not act on weirdly and I just thought of this because I realized that it was one of the examples he listed was um the sea monster because I think I would have just like I would be insecure about the fact that like maybe this thing I thought was a new sea monster was like a known creature <laughs> oh, I thought you were gonna say like so you because, just wouldn't trust yourself because, right. you, because of your lack of knowledge oh, I about thought, the deep sea I thought yeah. you meant like because Me then too. they Me might too. hunt and kill it or like oh, take that. it in and you're just protecting it like an E.T. I like, don't think that that I think that's it. something that happens in movies as bad as the world is I really don't think that if we discovered a sea monster that like 
everybody would ha- get into a contest to try to kill it. Like, I think that, I think that. Yes, they would. Well, and they, they try would, and capture it. They would capture it and they would sell us its blood as a startup. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, I, it, if it was posing an immediate threat, maybe they would. Like, if it was like a Godzilla. But if it was just like a Leviathan type thing that was chilling out on its own, minding its own business underwater. Doesn't Godzilla also just want to be loved? It's like, I love Godzilla. No, Me too. It. Yeah. Ugh. No, but it's not Godzilla's fault. No, it's Godzilla the scientist's is just fault. Like, it yeah. is, it is, Godzilla is the fault of all of us. Uh, Here's the issue with this question. It's not like a bad issue or a flaw with the question, but it's something to consider. Is like with Emily, you know, when Emily said, like, if it was a sea monster, you would lack the confidence to be able <laughs> to describe what you had seen as being like uniquely sea monsterish, a vampire and alien. So, like, you see, you get proof of aliens. I think you have like a pretty good base of people who would believe you and you could take this to them. Vampires, you're out of luck. Like, if I saw, <laughs> if I knew there were vampires, A, I wouldn't say anything because they'd come after me. And B, like, who wants to be on the side of people who think vampires are real? Oh, me. They really, I do. they've not had much credibility. I would go be a, a blood source for vampires if they were you real. You would? <laughs> <laughs> Emily, what? I would, Got I Anne Rice. If there was the opportunity to walk the walk when it comes to my goth lifestyle, I would absolutely go to you. What, jump if they, what if they feed off you to death, though? Like they well, they so do. Often and do. Then, but then it's you, such a rush, you cheat death. because such a rush. Then you become, become a vampire, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so you I join guess them. it would be like if they were good vampires who were just good vampires. Well, like you know, consensual vampires, like, um, okay. like uh, Bohemian versus vampires. like Peter Thiel vampires, right. right? You know, blood jacuzzi, like yeah. you know, sacrificing children in no, a blood rave kind, kind yeah. of thing. But I don't know what authorities you'd go to. With a vampire issue? Yeah, it would have to be like... <laughs> a- go to Reddit. <laughs> no, not Reddit. I would go to like a council of witches. You'd have to go to the Catholic Church, right? No, absolutely okay. not. I would find a vampire expert. So, th- Anne Rice. I mean, who? Well, you would and have vampire Rice. Definitely Anne Rice. Anne Rice. the vampire and- expert. In that case, I think, like, because the question is, like, would you have to dedicate your life to proving this? Like, I think you would have to become the vampire expert because such a thing doesn't really exist in, right now. Like, you would yeah. have to be that person because you had the firsthand experience with them. Well, like Christian Slater in Interview with the Vampire yeah. when he's interviewing the vampire. In a way, Emily, <laughs> when you said you would just become one, I'm like, that would be the best move is to become a vampire and then be like a spokesman for the vampires. Yeah, yeah. To be like, we exist, we're here. Like, I was a film critic at New York Magazine. <laughs> now I'm a vampire, and that's I understand just what sides I do. Of, of both yeah. experiences. Um. I hope you would still be on the podcast, though, because that would be a really worthwhile. Like, you could dedicate your life minus one day a week. We'd to have just to being actually record it at night, though. Uh, spoiler alert. We don't record this. Unless podcast. you're a Twilight vampire and then you just shimmer in the sun while you play oh, old timey yeah. baseball. Also, we could, you could come in the booth. We could turn off the lights. There's oh, no yeah. windows, obviously. You I could, mean, you a lot of things me about to the booth, like Justin Bieber, like with the blanket yeah. over my. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of things about vampirism already fit well with our general lifestyle. It's yeah. true. That's the only thing where I would like maybe <sighs> change my entire lifestyle around it. I think like everything else would be like I would be happy to be the whistleblower or something, and not not whistleblower in a way like go go kill the alien or whatever the thing may be. But I would be happy to be the person who was like, I have the video. I'm the person who brought this to the news. But like, I don't yeah. know that I would necessarily be spearheading. The, th- the thing but I would like to be a banicula mm-hmm. so a rabbit <laughs> vampire <laughs> yeah or or did you mean that like figuratively I think you understand <laughs> <laughs> um, I found out about a new UFO cult that we'll go visit next time Emily's in town oh, oh great great um, if you've got a question a comment or an erotic thriller uh, something to say about blood pills, maybe feelings about aliens, vampires, and sea monsters, give us a call at 24046-NIGHT or email us. The Night Call Podcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on social media at Night Call Podcast on Instagram, Night Call Pod on Twitter, and Night Call Podcast on Facebook. And please uh, subscribe to us on iTunes. You can rate, review, and subscribe tell us what you think about the show uh it helps more people find it oh we really appreciate you and that's our show for this week thank you see you you next week thank you thank Thank you you for for listening listening. (laughs) we're going to end death